close it? I thought I did. Access denied. Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, I hope everybody had a blessed Easter. And um, we are, we're going to be missing uh, Jared and uh, Laura Beth, which is too bad. Uh, but hopefully we'll have, uh, we'll have it recorded so they can get the information and uh, of our guest speaker. Christina Davis, Dr. Christina Davis. So uh, before we get going, oh, David, did you leave and are coming back? I don't know, I got another message that said you're trying to, to get on, but anyway, all right. So I hope everybody had a, had a, uh, a blessed Easter and uh, I appreciate you being here. And uh, this is an interesting book. It's a different book than the, the, the books that we've been using in that there's so many, so much attention to the body and so much attention to the integration and a really clear uh, uh, set of questions and topics and um, really messages and insights for persons of color, for persons uh, who are white, um, and then for police officers. I, I don't think any of us are police officers, but who knows? Um, there may be some, some, somebody who's had that experience or somebody in your family. Uh, so, you know, I encourage you to take, a, to, to read the sections um, for uh, at least the persons, uh, for the, the sections that are focused on black bodies and the sections that are focused on white bodies for all of the group to read that and maybe just kind of skim over the, the, the blue bodies, just kind of have this sense of what he's, what he's doing in, in those sections as well. Uh, we'll also have a, an expert who's gonna be coming and sharing with us her, um, I'm just gonna turn this off because Jared keeps text, texting me. Um, it's like, I'm in class, Jared, you know I'm in class. Uh, but anyway, um, so she's gonna come and speak with us uh, about the book and about how she has used the book. She's also a therapist and I'll introduce her when she gets here. But before we, yes, we wanna uh, remind everybody that we're welcoming Rosalind. She is a guest from another class. And I believe Rosalind, you are graduating this year, correct? That is correct. <laughs> All right, well, congratulations on that as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you, Doc. And uh, as I said privately to you, you know, you're welcome to, to join the groups 
uh, one of the groups. We, we're down two, two members, so you're welcome to join um, one of the groups. I think the, the amphibians are the ones that La, La, um, Larbath is not able to join us. So who's in the amphibians? Okay, Cassidy and Sarah Lynn. Uh, um, and Emily, are you in the amphibians as well? Okay. Emily. Yeah, so they did, opted not for a kind of biblical animal, but they still got an animal, so that's good. Um, I do have, I still have Howard Thurman in the background. Uh, that's what we studied uh, la my last two classes. And uh, there isn't actually a stained glass of, of uh, Resma. So I'll just keep that up there uh, for now. Anyway, so what I'd like us to do is do something a little bit different than what we usually do uh, to begin. So I'd like us to find us, us uh, yourselves in a comfortable seated posture. Really feel the, the butt cheeks on the, the seat or bed or wherever you're sitting. And you can take a moment and, and feel free to turn your camera off if you'd like, that's fine. We're gonna close our eyes in a second anyway, but um, and just attend to the breath. Maybe, uh, you know, it, just not even looking at the, the screen, just so you can have a sense of uh, slowly letting your eyes close. And just take a few moments as you're breathing to attend to the sensations in the nostrils. And feel the breath. As you inhale the coolness in the nostrils, feel it come down into the lungs, fill the lungs and exhale. And the next one, we're gonna go deeper. So we're inhaling, feeling in the nostrils and the lungs, and then let the belly relax and release, pushing the belly button out. And as you exhale, pull that belly button back in and let the breath come out of the lungs and through the nostrils. We'll do that a few times, just attending to the sensations in the body. And if you haven't already, either close your eyes or let there be a soft focus. And just notice where your hands are. Maybe they're on your lap, on your knees. And just take a few a moments here and, and mentally visualize your body. I'm going to kind of go, we're going to travel it. I'm going to notice the top of the head. Probably don't have a lot of sensations there. Just feel the energy. There's a chakra on at the top, above the top of the head. Just feel that energy flowing down. Almost as if there's, there's water or something that feels really good. Flowing off the top of your head down your face, and in your jaws, soften and relax. Let your shoulders release. Feel that relaxation and that awareness going through your shoulders, your upper arms, your upper chest and back. It slide down your back and your chest, past your belly, your lower back, your lumbar, and your elbows, into your sitting bones and muscles, and down your legs, with the palms of the hand, feel the release. The energy continue to flow down past the knees, down the calves, down the ankles, and to the top of the foot, and sole of the foot. Let the flow out the tips of the toes. You just notice how the body feels. Take a few breaths and stay here for a minute or two.
Welcome everyone. So today we're going to talk about uh, My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Minikin. And Christina Davis should be joining us shortly. And she's going to share her experience as an African American and a therapist and how important this book is. I just want to name a couple things that I think are particularly important as we're getting ready for her. Um, and and I note that I asked you to explore the a couple of the practices, and um, it, he he often suggests that it be something that you read over a year with a group of people. And so we didn't have a year, um, but we do have a group of people. So that's why I didn't ask you to do every single exercise, but I, I hope that, or at least record every single exercise, but I do hope that the exercises that you chose to do were, were, were powerful and, and helpful in getting in touch with your body and getting in touch with the, the radicality of issues of race, how it's been imprinted and in, in, in our bodies. Um, issues of white white um, supremacy or white um, privilege, uh, and wondering, I'm wondering. I mean, how does that imprint in other people's bodies? Um, how does it imprint for folks whose whose ancestors maybe um, participated in uh, slavery, slave trade, whose ancestors were slaves, um, and I'm sure that it makes a, a bigger difference um, having things uh, in your actual genetic history, um, but also noting that there are assumptions, and we've talked about embedded assumptions in the, in, in the intro to theology class, which most of you have taken or are taking, um, and how we have embedded assumptions that are embedded in our bodies. They're embedded in our minds, but also embedded in our bodies. Uh, and so this is one of the things I like about this book so much is that, that he, he, he wants to go through the, the intellectual or, or um, cognitive claims um, with awareness in the body and helping us as persons of color or persons um, of lighter skin to in engage what's going on in the body. I mean, and where are we, where have we encoded these things in the body? How does our body respond uh, to issues uh, of racial trauma or even of just racial interaction? Um, and some of that I'm sure has to do with experience. I was talking to someone recently or sharing with someone recently who, who is a person not of color, um, but has spent um, some quite a bit of time engaging in these questions, these issues and spending time with persons of color and noticing how her body is shifting in the way that she responds, the way that it responds almost unconsciously. Um, and just being aware of that, I think it can take a while before we um, can become aware of that because uh, we've been trained not to, some of us. So uh, some of the things he talks about that I think are particularly important are clean pain and dirty pain. And those are on page 19 and 20. Uh, and for those of you who don't remember what that is, it'd probably be helpful to, to look, at, look at that again. And, um, oh, hey, there's Dr. Davis. Hi, Dr. Davis. Hey, I love Dan. the way you've got yourself in, in focus and the rest of it out of focus. That's fancy. <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks. Yeah. So we're very happy to have you here. Hang on just a second. At the last minute, um, thank you. At the last minute, I um, I decided to come outside because it was so beautiful instead of being cooped upstairs. And so some of my notes were upstairs. Um, but so the, I'm, I'm sure that all of you um, have heard of, if not met or taken a class from Dr. Davis, but in case you haven't, or in case it's been a while since you thought about her uh, or read her blurb, um, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, and. Uh, to have your uh, to have you share your engagement with and your understanding of my grandmother's hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, just for those of you who uh, 
um, don't know Dr. Christina Davis. Uh, she's a clinical professor of pastoral theology and marriage and family therapy. She's ordained in the Progressive Baptist Church and her focus areas include spirituality and integrated counseling. Um, she's also uh, looked at um, a relational psychoanalytic theory. Did I get that right? That's okay. right, yeah. Self-state multiplicity, um, particularly among women of color. Um, so, uh, you know, we don't, I don't know, maybe you read everybody else's bio, but I haven't read this before. So I didn't know you were doing this self-state multiplicity. I think that's a really interesting, and that's actually, I wrote my dissertation on multiplicity. Oh, no. Same uh, here. That was my dissertation focus as well. Who knew we had so much in common? <laughs> that is neat. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have to chat about that. We um, will. Yeah. Um, Anyway, we're very glad you're here. And do you know everybody here? Or actually, let's just, I ask everybody to just, you know, say your name and if there's something, you know, like your degree program, or, you know, or um, something interesting you wanna share. So I'm gonna start with um, Jill. Hi, Dr. Davis, good to hey, see you. Jill. good to um, see you. I'm here uh, right now for a, a demon. Welcome back. And I don't know, did you say we're supposed to say something interesting? Yeah. Um, so I'm in Florida uh, right oh. now with my family, which is why the background looks all different. So nice. Anyway, but good to be here with everybody. Oh, I have to tell you where, yeah, because nobody knows where anybody is. Um, Sarah Lynn. Hi, I'm Sarah Lynn. Uh, we've had a class. I've had a class with you. I'm in Div MTS. Um, something interesting is I just realized that since everything is on Zoom, I could visit my family in Florida. For some reason, that was just the first time that occurred to me in this whole year. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, Florida is the place to be. Wish I was there, Jill. <laughs> and Cassidy. Yeah, hello, Dr. Davis, good to see you. Uh, we had an intensive together, which was a wonderful class. And uh, I'm an MDiv MTS student and something interesting is, yeah, I read my grandmother's hands uh, over the summer, last summer, and it radically changed both my theology and my, um, yeah, my view of my own psychology, so. Yeah, good to see you again, Kathy. And Brittany. Hi, Dr. Davis. Hey, Brittany. Brittany Yant, <laughs> I miss seeing you at the Counseling Center. Um, I'm MDiv, um, CMHC dual degree. And the most interesting thing right now is that I graduate this year, so. That's right. <laughs> I almost heard you say I'm a senior at the counseling center. I was like, that doesn't <laughs> sound right, but I'm prepared to celebrate anyway. So let me say this because I knew you're graduating. <laughs> yes, yes. Good to see you, Brittany. And Bree. Hey, Dr. Davis. Good to see you hey, again. Bree. We've already chatted. Um, <laughs> so I'm in the DMIN program. And since there's so much talk about Florida, I'm actually moving to Florida. So. Wow. Um, Oh, wow. Right after I graduate, if not before. Yeah, exciting things. Yes. Congrats. I trust something exciting is on the horizon. <laughs> and Elliot? Hi, my name is Elliot Herod, and I'm in the um, Hi, in MTS program. And um, I'm not in my normal location in Indy. I'm uh, house sitting for my in-laws up in Fort Wayne area. So, okay. um, not Florida, but the not Florida. So, <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Good to meet you. And David, you look like you're in a different location as well. Can't hear you, David. Yeah. Mm. 
still can't hear you. How about now when I unplug? Yeah. I can okay, hear you now. So, uh, I'm actually at my house. I'm just sitting in a different place than I usually sit. Uh, I'm an MTS student. Dr. Davis, I've never had the pleasure of meeting you before, so I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. And uh, I did something that shouldn't have been interesting, but was I went to the CTS campus today and read from the book on campus in the library, which was a fun change of pace for me. Yeah, nice. Was it good to be back in that setting? It was good. Yeah, yeah. Very good. It's a, it's a wonder. Say oh, that sorry. again. Well, I was just saying it's a wonder how those things, um, I appreciate them more myself, just being able to go to campus. I was there last week to pick up some books and yeah, I had a similar experience. Just sitting in my office was nice. Yeah. Emily? Um, I'm Emily. I'm in the MDiv program. Um, I took a class with you, the agent. Yeah. 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 Um, however long ago that was. <laughs> um, it was just the fall. I know so much has happened I know. since. <laughs> Um, I don't know, something interesting. I went for a run this morning and was like actually surprised that I could run like the full three miles because I haven't ran. Okay. I was like, all right, you're not terrible. <laughs> no, not that at all. But I'm inspired. Okay. And Rosalind. Hi, Dr. Davis. Hi, Rosalind. I am graduating soon. Yes. <laughs> That is most interesting, but I'm excited to be here. As you know, you introduced me to the book of discussion uh, during our uh, guided uh, independent study. So I'm excited to be here today. Thank you Wonder. again. Yeah, we're glad you're here. All right. Well, Dr. Dave, I, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. I've got a little PowerPoint presentation. It's saying host, there we go, thank you. So thank you for having me. Um, you know, when Professor Russell invited me to speak on this topic, I um, was immediately um, interested because it is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. It's, um, it's just, always present with me in, in some way or another. And I really take my experience in some ways back to 2017, around that time when um, it, it emerged out of having um, the embodied kind of lived experience of racial trauma to being able to kind of name, research, um, think more, in depth about it, put some language towards it. And um, it, in 2017, CTS hosted a conversation called uh, Race. Um, it was, um, let me make sure I've got the title correct, uh, Race, Trauma, and Healing. And so the purpose of the conversation was really to talk directly about this experience um, and, and process it, help, help ourselves process it. And I found myself putting language to something that I had not yet. Um, and so a lot of what I'll be sharing today um, comes out of that research um, and um, how it's developed over, over the years. So the goals that I have for the next few minutes that we have together is really to offer um, a definition of racial trauma to explore briefly a theology of racial trauma, as I understand it, and of course to identify wellness practices because um, to identify uh, the ways that trauma impacts us um, would not be sufficient for me as a practitioner and someone who's concerned with, with health, healing, and wholeness even more than I'm concerned with theories and definitions that I really wanna leave you all with some 
uh, some practices that I think um, Resma Minikin does a great job of outlining, but also kind of bringing forth a few other sources. So as I begin to go through the slides, please jump in. And by jump in, I mean unmute yourselves and um, jump in with your voice because I won't be able to see. I'm gonna have you all wonderful faces minimized so that I can see the screen, but please jump in as um, prompted. Here we go. So one thing that I wanna name is that even though I'm centering race and particularly that of black and brown um, bodies and how trauma impacts uh, that experience, race of course does not exist in a vacuum. And so I am very much a firm believer in intersectionality in that gender, class, sexuality, ability, religion, um, all these other ways of identifying influence how one experiences um, even something like racialized trauma. Um, and additionally, as we talk about um, the psyche or the mind, as we talk about what's happening in the body, that is in no way, of course, as you all have been um, discovering or talking about um, in this course, it's in no way detached somehow from, from the soul. And so, um, I'm really taking for granted that all these things are connected. So I understand racialized trauma. Um, for me, just like any form of trauma, it's, it's that invisible reality that can be still very much so real and present um, in ourselves and in those that we encounter. And that's part of the insidiousness and in some ways, the ways that it can create um, all the more damage is because either we don't name it, um, therefore don't express it and, and, and respond to it in ways that might be health promoting, but also we don't recognize it in others. And so the trauma informed care question of, um, you know, what happened to them, right? What happened to us? versus what's wrong with them or what's wrong with us. It's this movement to really acknowledging that it's not just something intrinsic um, that we're, we're, we're suffering with or something that's just about us, but it is also about um, what happens to us that can create trauma. And so what is racialized or what is racial trauma? We use that sometimes interchangeably. And so right around that time, um, there were other folks at the time in 2017 when CTS hosted this talk, um, which by the way, we hosted a second time uh, a couple of years back in 2019. Um, but others were talking about this at the same time and a few ways of describing and, and learning and discovering about racial trauma is written here, it can result from racial harassment, um, witnessing racial violence. So not even it occurring to oneself, but just witnessing it, right? On social media and news covering, um, news coverage that the witnessing can create this trauma traumatic um, event and experience, but also institutional racism which again, can be so quickly um, uh, deemed as invisible, right? It can, it can be so insidious that it's hard to um, sometimes even answer the question of what, what happened, um, but the experience is there nonetheless. And I'll also kind of name my part of my um, epistemo epistemological um, source as experience as a womanist, um, theologian that um, there are times when there's an experience of something and you may not always be able to point to all of the uh, what others might consider it objective data or um, uh, evidence that supports but when you know it kind of deep in your soul and in your bones that something has happened um, it's important to name that and I think that's that particular practice is going to return as one of the wellness practices at the end um, but institutional racism, um, trauma may result 
in experiencing symptoms of depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, humiliation, poor concentration, irritability. So these are all kind of what people would consider mental health related or um, you know, uh, psychological impacts. And I think when it comes to the teaching and training that we do at, in the counseling center and our counseling programs, um, it, one way to be culturally competent uh, is to name that racism in and of itself can be a presenting problem. It can be um, that which is causing the distress that even is showing up as depression, anxiety, um, and so forth. And so the other piece is that, um, so another, another analytical review here talks also about anxiety and depression, but also decreased life satisfaction and psychiatric symptoms, including that of PTSD and paranoia. And so one of the movements that the DSM-5 took from the DSM-4 before it was that it put PTSD as a disorder into a trauma category, moving it out of an anxiety category, which I, I, I think it really signals in general, this awareness of trauma um, and the taking seriously of the, the, um, the impact of trauma in even the field of mental health. But, um, you know, I'm really, really excited and was excited to hear about this course um, here for understanding what trauma has to do with, um, with our theology and with our own understanding of holistic uh, wellness. And so in the DSM-5, trauma as um, it relates to PTSD has to meet these five criteria, um, at least one of the first four, and then two of the last one. Um, and if all of these things are present, then you can be said to have PTSD. And so these, this particular um, diagnosis is not the same as what I would understand as racial trauma, but there are some ways in which it is not mutually exclusive. Someone could certainly, most certainly um, experience PTSD as a result of racial trauma, but not everyone um, would necessarily have this diagnosis. And so you can kind of see why, right? So criteria one, exposure to a death, whether it be um, a threatened death, you know, or an actual, um, uh, death, threatened injury, or actual injury. Um, it could be something that happened to you or be by exposure. Um, and you know, a lot of times when I think about this in my own experience, this type of threat is so pervasive um, when it comes to just riding down the street, right, and seeing a cop car pull up where that might be something that's a real benign event for some. For others, there's this, this experience of potential threat that's very palpable. I know that for me, there are times where, and it's, and it's just, it's automatic, right? I'm not thinking about it. It's, it's, it's in that central nervous system of heightened awareness, you know, how, you know, it, do I put my blinker on, right? Am I stopping full stop at the, at the stop time? I, I am hyper aware that depending on how I move, there could be a situation that can get out of hand. And, um, and even of course, if I don't right, move or even if I do everything right. So there's this way of being in day-to-day -day events and having the presence of um, perceived or potential threat and again, we're talking about on a spectrum here. It's not to say, again, that, that even that experience that I just described means that that, that, that is a PTSD reaction, but the, similar, the ways in which those features show up, I think are really helpful for us to describe um, racial trauma in, in all of its forms. And so this traumatic event is often in criteria two, re-experienced. And so there's a sense of whether it be um, flashbacks, um, you know, kind of this, this idea that, um, you know, even if it's not happening 
again, it feels like it's happening. Um, and certainly the media helps with that, this inundation of, of images and happenings that can, can be um, perpetuated through, through media. Avoidance um, of that trauma-related thought or feeling, negative thoughts or feelings after the trauma. So that includes about oneself, but also about the world. I don't know if, every, if anyone's experienced kind of negative thoughts about the world or difficulty holding on to hope, um, right? So these are some of the features of, of PTSD. And then lastly, a trauma reaction um, that gets worse after the trauma. So um, irritability, aggression, hypervigilance, heightened startle reaction. Um, difficulty concentrating and difficulty sleeping. And so related to that, that clinical diagnostic criteria, the signs of that that can be um, you know, observed or experienced by the individual include um, these kinds of body pieces with body aches, heart palpitations, um, but also some of the emotions like anxiety, um, outbursts of anger, right? So if we just take, take all of this together um, and going back to that initial slide that how experiences of trauma and racial trauma can be so invisible um, that if we were to just look at the outburst of anger and make meaning out of what someone is experiencing without asking ourselves the question, of what happened to them, we can really miss the boat of naming and understanding the pain, understanding the trauma that belies those things. And so related to this is the notion of secondary trauma or compassion fatigue as it's sometimes called. Um, secondary trauma as it relates to, to race I think is a very common experience and in fact, um, fueled movements, right? Um, I can't breathe, right? I am Trayvon Martin. These are not rallying cries that are um, uh, coincidental. I think they are very much so connected to the ways that we experience even vicariously through others, um, the trauma that someone else is at the hands of, right? The violence that someone else is at the hands of. And you can see that represented in a lot of the, um, the social movements and the calls for justice that follow. Um, I remember when President Obama at the time was talking about um, you know, the, the murder of, of Trayvon Martin, he said, Michelle and I don't have a son, but if we did, we believe that he would look a lot like Trayvon. And I think that sentiment was shared a lot of, um, among Black families, right? Especially where this was something where we could easily see, right? I could easily see myself in a hoodie um, and being considered suspicious. I could easily see my brother. I could easily see my, you know, my, my nephew, right, being this young man. And it was, it was as if it was happening to us, right? And so this, this, this way of understanding and naming um, secondary trauma, I think is really relevant. And so my understanding is that you're also reading um, Traumatic, uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome by Joy Leary. And she coins this phrase in order to really also broaden the scope of this picture of trauma to remind um, readers that trauma is something that can be, and trauma reactions can be learned, but also embedded um, in our bodies, which I think, um, the book, My Grandmother's Hands, really gets at the ways that it's embedded in our bodies um, from generations past, right? So intergenerational transmission of trauma. And so she writes about how um, 
you know, after 265 years of chattel slavery, followed by Jim, Jim Crow, followed by the multiple kind of um, myriad of ways that institutionalized racism continued and continues, that there, there, was, there was no kind of mass intervention such that, um, you know, there, there was therapeutic resources um, provided for those who experience this. And so what happens is those, um, the behaviors that in many ways protect from the, um, the trauma and the re-traumatization can get passed on to future generations. Um, the behaviors that, that seek to cope or that seek to kind of um, to manage can get passed on. And so she talks about kind of more of the learned behaviors. Um, and part of uh, the continuation, I think, of, or I wouldn't say the continuation because the Clarks predate um, Leary, but I think one way that we see this is in the advent of Black psychology, which we consider Kenneth Clark and his wife, Mamie, Phipps Clark as the um, father and mother of Black psychology, which started with the doll study, the famous doll study, which studied how, how children, you know, preschool age children have internalized messages learned from um, external sources about the value of Black bodies and white bodies, right? And so for any of those who say, well, that's, you know, that's, that's a long time ago, 1947, lots of progress since then, um, lots has changed. Um, Anderson Cooper did a segment in 2010 where the results were very, very similar as to 1947, which of course is just completely unacceptable. So, um, that that internalization is still is still happening. That learning is still happening. And so, as we talk about kind of black bodies, white bodies, Dominican uh, talks about blue bodies. He reminds us that um, white on white violence, um, so to speak didn't, I mean, it, it, this was something that was carried over, that, that violence against um, African bodies, right, um, as, we, as we know it in this country as, um, you know, chattel slavery, that was a violence that didn't start there, right? It started, um, we could trace it probably to multiple places. One is um, centuries of medieval br brutality, which I thought was really illuminating for me when I read this book, you know, a few years ago, it really did um, help me to understand. Again, it, re it reinforces the notion that um, violence is intergenerational, um, and it can be passed passed on. Right, violent ways of being and reacting and responding. And so, I want to kind of pause as we've laid the groundwork, so to, so to speak, about racial trauma and, um, and ask this question of the group about why do you, do you think um, that Menekin says that interrace dialogues alone will not save us? I think, Dr. Davis, because there's so much um, conflict and things that get um, are we're, we're pushing up against each other's stuff. So we really can't help can't have healthy conversations interracially. We need to do our healing on our own so that we can see our blind spots. Um, yeah. So often, I think people are unable to receive good critical feedback because they're defensive and because the person that th that's given that feedback um, is maybe on the oppressed side where they can't fully receive it or they're on the side of privilege in which they still can't receive it. So I think that he's essentially 
telling people to hold yourselves responsible to do your own healing before we can come together and heal in community. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. What about others? Anybody want to share anything about the body? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I could say that much better than Brie already did. I, I, um, I feel like that's true in so many areas of our life, you know, in marriages and, and the more, um, connected you are with people, the more that becomes obvious, um, that you have your own stuff that you're bringing <laughs> that doesn't really have anything to do with the other person. Um, and this is just, a, this is another area where that's true. Uh, about the bodies, um, yeah, I, I think it's, in, I appreciate in this book the, um, one of, so one of the things I wrote in my reflection was that I had been engaged in racial justice activism for, uh, for a long time in my adult life and have read a lot about racial justice and racism. And I still felt like, I still felt, I, and I was able to even identify in my life ways and times that I've acted in a racist way, you know, and been able to say like, okay, I don't want to do that any, do that or whatever. But I still would find like, I still could never be centered and comfortable in an interracial space, right? Like at the, at these things, I constantly still felt like so much tenuousness, so much anxiety, you know, and when you have those feelings in your body, it's hard to, um, respond to people in a measured or a calm way. It's hard not to jump to conclusions. It's hard not to, et cetera. So yeah, I found this book really helpful for identifying the way in which you need to engage and become aware of what's happening in your body. Because I don't think until my friend recommended that I read this book when we were talking about this, I don't think I ever really understood what I needed to be processing, you know? I never would have thought like, oh, I need to really become present to the way my body feels in this moment um, and how I then respond from a, a different place than just out of those uncomfortable physical reactions. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know about the epigenetics and all of the research around that, but there's definitely a way in which our bodies have been conditioned to have these responses that if we're unaware of, I don't think it matters how much, I mean, the other stuff is good stuff, but it doesn't matter how much you do that, you can't be in a healthy relationship um, where you're really yourself, you know, as long as those things are there. Yeah, yeah. I think that there is something with both of you all um, responding, there's something to be said about that responsibility for the self and the embodied way that um, we show up in these dialogues. It's not just a kind of intellectual enterprise to share thoughts and perspectives. And um, it doesn't, in reality, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not experienced as just a conversation. It is an embodied experience. We are embodied um, people. And so for us to take responsibility for how we show up helps get us to that next um, step of healing, according to Minikin, that that conversation alone will not do. And so just to echo what you all have said, you know, he says in his own practice, right, of, of being a therapist, right, that being able to have insights, to have understanding, to cognitively understand, um, you know, racism and isms of all sorts, I would imagine supplies to, is not the same as getting out of those patterns and reactions, um, those, under, those ways in which, you know, there could still be perceived threat um, when we're talking across uh, difference of different kinds, right? Um, because trauma is embedded in bodies and not in our brains. And so, you know, one of the, one of the uh, things that he writes in his book that I think was super, um, like it just resonated on such a deep level that a lot of times when people talk about, you know, what their therapist 
enables for them and provides for them is that people can borrow from a therapist's settled nervous system, right? And so it's not even about what we're saying. I mean, sorry um, to all the therapists on this call that, you know, it's not really about the wonderful things that we offer, but oftentimes it's when we can, right? Because it's certainly not um, to be assumed, but when we can offer the settled nervous system that can be felt by another human being and borrowed from and, 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 and perhaps even modeled, right? Um, emulated, right? They can feel that sense of calm that can be just as healing, right? Is, is anything that we can say. And so he really talks about the power of that ability. Um, so again, what, is somebody jumping in? I hear them. Okay, jump in if you want. Um, one of the best things that what, what that we could do is metabolize our own pain and heal our trauma. And that's not to say that it's necessarily a process that takes place in isolation or anything, but it is to say, um, I think the word was used, responsibility for that type of process um, to grow room in our nervous systems. Um, that this is the key for Minikin of making sure that we don't pass on as much as we, um, we say, of course, we don't want to or don't intentionally um, try to pass on, um, uh, you know, traumatic ways of being to others that we can kind of put a, um, uh, a stop to the intergenerational transmission of these kind of traumas. And so he offers five key anchors for the body as we attend to our own trauma. So the first is learning to soothe ourselves, to quiet our minds, calm our hearts and settle our bodies. Now, I know that you all have been doing work on this in this course. I'm wondering if anyone would be willing to share how this process is going for you so, so far. How do you feel like you've been able to practice this, right? This is a practice. So I've noticed since this class began that without thinking about it, but just sort of instinctively, I think because we're spending so much time talking about the body that I find myself um, taking more time to stand up out of my chair and stretch or um, stop and take a few deep breaths. Like I, I find that I'm more attentive to those things than I, than I have been before. Um, mm -hmm. Just from, I think just from the exposure to the class, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. has been, um, it, it has had a, a calming sense and a, a sense of uh, well-being. Mm -hmm. It feels different, particularly in my office, like during the work, during the work week. I really notice it there. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm thinking about thinking back to what it means to, um, you know, metabolize trauma. What it means to show up differently in times. You know, I, I know. Um, so Resma Minikin does has done trainings in implicit bias, right? And trainings with um, law enforcement, right? Um, how transformative would it be for? law enforcement, right? Blue bodies, right? Blue bodies that are made up of, you know, all races, but blue bodies to be aware of their body, know when they are feeling something uh, as it relates to their own relationship to, to their body, not what the other is doing to them, right? Um, what, what might that do? So yeah, I think that that's huge. 
think that that's huge. And so as a practice, right, um, noticing sensations, vibrations, emotions, not reacting to them, right? We are not the same thing as our sensations, vibrations, and emotions. We can have an observing mind to say, I notice what's happening um, without reacting, right? And I'm gonna keep kind of, in terms of racialized trauma, I'm gonna keep going back to, you know, what transformation could look like when the first thing that someone thinks, right, is I fear it for my life because they see something that internally does create fear, right? We know that we know that implicit bias is real and it exists, but what does it mean to metabolize, to heal, and to be in relationship with those kind of internal sensations differently? Okay, so notice, not react. Anchor three, learn to accept discomfort and notice when it changes instead of trying to flee from it. So trauma, often um, the, the trauma reactions of fight, flight, or flee, um, or fight, flight, or freeze, excuse me, um, often occur when, when we feel that sense in our, in our um, nervous system that there is threat. Um, but there is sometimes threat. We need to be able to acknowledge uh, that that's, that's a survival mechanism that we don't want to do away with. But is there, is there a trained enough nervous system where we can also know that it's not all the same, right? That discomfort is not automatically real threat. Um, can we notice and accept that some discomfort um, is clean. I think I heard you say, Professor Russell, right? Clean pain, right? That there's something about it that we can learn from and not just, um, you know, tap, tamp down and try to escape from. Yeah, so I think that what he talks about is differentiating clean clean pain from, from dirty pain. And it has a lot to do with our um, response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, discomfort is not all bad. It's not all created equal, absolutely. Um, and then he mentions anchor, anchor four, the capacity to stay present in our bodies as we move through an unfolding experience with all its ambiguity and uncertainty and respond from the best parts of ourselves. I think one of the things about the anchors, um, yeah, that Rizma points to is that it's as someone with anxiety, it's really reminiscent of uh, different grounding techniques and grounding mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. movements. But yet, you know, obviously a, a different context, but recognizing perhaps not only the similarities, but also the connections there. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. And being able to yeah. recognize and train your body kind of for me to train my body on on both ends in, you know, grounding with anxiety and also, you know, anchoring myself in, in these given situations, but um, yeah, and just how they inform each other too and, and overall help to, to anchor, ground and heal. Absolutely, there is so much relationship between anxiety and um, what we're talking about here as it relates to trauma. Um, I mean, you may, you may recall when I was mentioning, even though PTSD as a form of trauma was moved to a, tra a trauma category disorder, it for a while was under anxiety, a type of anxiety because they are interrelated, right? Categories sometimes just break down. We try to bifurc bifurcate experiences, but, but so much of what we're talking about when we talk about trauma is related to anxiety um, and the same grounding exercises, you know, some of them are probably overlapping with what we see here um, that Resma offers up. It, it, they, they kind of address the same kind of um, learning how to settle that he's talking about, um, cleansing breaths, exercise, you know, ways of discharging that type of energy, cathartic dancing, um, worship, um, you know, ways of not keeping um, the trauma 
you know, uh, internalized, but really having a place to go. Um, and so trying to get my cursor to, there it is, to wake up. And so, so I think that these are really um, important uh, ways of understanding healing that he offers. I will also um, mention that Ken Hardy, who is one of the marriage and family therapist um, researchers that I look to as well for understanding of um, racial trauma. He writes about how um, the number one thing we can do um, among each other, um, among allies in safe spaces is, is name what has happened, right? Um, there's a saying that we're only as sick as our secrets. And um, we all are also reading the book, The Body Keeps the Score. It's not gonna go away. It's not going to be um, something that uh, doesn't have an impact on us just because we don't talk about it. And so um, his number one um, encouragement is to, to name it and to talk about it, give voice to the experiences. And so finally, I'll just end on a note of a theology of racial trauma and um, who I quote in, I think, I, I think captures why, I, why this identification with the other is so common is that I, I believe in Ubuntu, meaning we are all connected, right? So it's a, an African principle um, that was made more popularized by Desmond Tutu's use of it as a South um, African theologian, um, Bishop, who said that, you know, our, our humanity is, is inextricably linked to others, right? It's bound up in others, um, that it's, it's, it's a part of our human experience to, to see what someone else is experiencing and to, to share in that, you know, whether it's good or whether it's painful. And I think as I, I hear, um, you know, Resma talk about how we can pass on, right, healing to future generations or to other bodies or to other kind of people and encounters, or we can pass on, you know, more pain or more trauma, that this is also another way of, I think, understanding how intimately we are all linked with one another as Ubuntu reminds us. And so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen, trying to keep us to time here. But that's what I have. Dr. Davis, would you be willing to share those slides by chance? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll send them to you, uh, Dr. Russell, and then I trust that you can share it with everyone. Yes, great. I'm happy to do that and thank you. Thank you, Cassidy, for asking. Uh, I wonder if uh, folks have questions or comments that they'd like to ask of, of Dr. Davis or, or share. I, I guess I do. I know I've been talking a lot though, but. Um, no, please, go ahead. So, so kind of a two-part question maybe, but like, like when I read this book, it, again, like I said, it was life-changing, like a, a whole new way to see the truth of what's happening. And yet, like, I kind of see like a psychological issue and that there's also a theological issue and they feel separate, but, but they also coexist. And so my question is like, how is something like this introduced and or moved through in a therapeutic setting mm. um, and, and can mm -hmm. the theological piece be I don't know if that makes sense but can the theological piece also be a part of that because I think you know like we talk about embedded theologies right well I think like a lot of embedded theologies in a way are tethered to um like white supremacist values um so I just see it as all connected, but it's also mm -hmm. enmeshed in things. And I wonder like, what does it look like in a therapeutic setting to work or move through these kinds of things? 
I absolutely think, I mean, at least the training of therapists here is to um, integrate embedded theologies and exploring those into the therapy. It's, it's fair, fair ground to, um, to teal, so to speak, um, in therapy. But I, you know, because I think, it, so there's a way in which every theology has an embedded um, human anthropology or psychology, understanding of human um, behavior, if you will, and vice versa, right? The way we understand, um, you know, humanity and the world, I think, is not devoid if underneath it of some kind of um, theology, whether people kind of name it that or just kind of ultimate concern, right? Um, and so I think I know for myself, I find it helpful to to be conceptualizing with from both lenses. And I think they're very much so um, persons for whom absolutely their brand of Christianity has um, has uh, been a source of um, uh, em emboldening or normalizing of certain uh, understandings of, of how we relate um, to violence, how we relate to difference, um, you know, white supremacy is uh, this understanding that some lives, right, are supreme to, than to others. And so um, that certain experiences of Christianity certainly um, I think can be examined in a therapeutic space. But also I feel like there, you know, and I, and I think there are people on this call that could probably speak to this as well. Um, I know for me, when I am in a therapeutic space, and when I'm working across racial difference, um, the primary uh, kind of the equalizer is 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 this humanity, and um, whether or not you know there's someone who who comes with racist views, because I believe that I mean I believe that that everybody comes into a space with with some particular isms that, right, even, even myself, uh, that haven't been fully worked through. I do think it, it's, it's a powerful tool to work through. Um, therapy is a powerful tool to work through the need for those isms without even addressing them. And I, a quote comes to mind, I hope this might help um, kind of clarify my own thinking, but, um, James Baldwin actually uh, has a quote where he said, you know, when white people are able to love themselves enough to let go of the need for the Negro problem, which he which he kind of uses in his particular context, um, then, you know, it, it will it will it will go away like it won't it won't be necessary anymore. So there's this connection between self-love, no matter what race, you know, and the need for what, it, how we respond or how we're in relationship with others that I see as kind of cross-cutting. So that's a really long answer, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So other questions? Uh, uh, let, let me, let me, um, I just wanted to clarify, Dr. Davis, it sounds like what you and Cassidy were saying um, and your quote from, from uh, James Baldwin is that when we're no longer dependent upon a problematic embedded assumption um, that is really something that we're holding on to to protect ourselves from something that we probably don't even really need to be protected from um, or a uh, negative understanding of who God is or how guilty we are or that sort of thing. Um, speaking of like the Calvinists, um, 
then the embedded assumptions can be more easily the, the problematic embedded assumptions can be more easily um, discarded. Yes, absolutely. That you know that that loosening of the grip, <laughs> right? When we can kind of focus on um, our relationship with ourselves, and you know, yeah, that I think that it's uh, it's one of those things in therapy where how we are with others says more about us than it does about others, right? This kind of, again, cross-cutting um, rule of thumb that it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity to really be in, um, in more examined, more kind of aware relationship with ourselves. Yeah, so when we no longer feel uh, like we need a judgmental God, mm-hmm. we won't have one. Then process yeah, it. yeah more appealing yeah yeah so relationship we, with the divine within ourselves as well right yeah and how that's reflected mm-hmm. great mm-hmm. go process yeah no I, I, I think it's a really it's a really helpful sort of interplay between psychology and theology yeah i mean i mean internally what's going on with the person and their development are or development's the wrong word but um their movement and pr- progress toward a healing way of being in the world with themselves, then also uh, is expressed in a theological change too, intellectually too. Yeah. 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 So yeah. That, I like that. Um, Indeed. Sarah Lynn has been very patient with her. <laughs> See? Yes. And thank you for um, finding the quote, Cassidy. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Especially patient with all the lauding of process theology. No, I just, I'm joking. I'm going to leave that alone. I, what I'm curious about is um, the, um, the book, he doesn't approach it from a Christian perspective. And, you know, as someone within a church and um, wanting to you know, bring this to my congregation. Do you have any thoughts or recommendations around how to kind of conceptualize this or discuss this from, I think we were kind of already doing that a little bit, but from a Christian perspective? Yeah, I think, um, so he does borrow from some of the practices, um, like spiritual religious practices of dancing or worship or singing or rocking. Um, And I think depending on the tradition, right, that might be some more native to some traditions than others. But um, yeah, it's not a decidedly, uh, you know, Christian or religious text. I think that there's some overlap within this text. And um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the um, Stand Your Ground text, um, Kelly Brown Douglas, who is an Episcopal uh, priest, and she uh, also kind of talks about some of the same themes. I might, um, I took part in a book reading process um, between two churches, actually. Uh, They were having uh, some dialogue around that text. So it may be that the two can happen somehow hand in hand, or you can kind of borrow um, from the one, well, borrowed from the Dominican book while reading the other. Um, but I think what I like about his book is also depending on where you're entering, right? He has exercises for that embodied experience, right? If you are in, um, a white embodied kind of person, there are practices, you know, um, mindfulness exercises that he walks you through um, specifically for for that experience. And then as you know, a black embodied person. And so I think um, depending again on the context, you can also kind of make make it most relevant to that context by by focusing on those exercises. Um, And so, yeah, I think, I think Kelly Brown Douglas offers quite a bit of um, theology that that you can also use, um, but also feel free to 
use Ubuntu to understand kind of how <laughs> this is, you know, is interconnected. So, yeah. It makes me think, uh, I mean, I appreciate the comment and the question, and it makes me think of a an interesting exercise for uh, us or for um, a group to do, and that is to um, bring some of the exercises that he's suggesting and bring some theological um, depth to them or some elements in it sort of sort of adapt adapt them to a theological context uh, whether that be uh, experiences in church or whether that be you know just the 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 fact that we have I think the Christian tradition has a lot of resources and and um, traditions that many of us don't follow anymore, but um, that we that people have followed in terms of of meditation and dance and movement. And I mean, if, you, if you've ever been to an All Saints Church, there's lots of movement going on. What if we understand that movement in a different way? What if we name that movement in relation to um, what we're thinking about in terms of trauma and take our understanding of, of what Resma is doing and try to adapt a little bit, take actually, let's do the reverse, taking our experience in the church and our experience of God's presence and um, bring that, those glasses into uh, some of the exercises uh, that Resma's um, mannequin is asking us to do. I think that would be a creative um, and very helpful project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to scoot to my next appointment here. So I want to just thank you again, Professor Russell, for the invitation and to the entire class for your engagement. It was wonderful to be with you all. And so feel free, of course, to um, reach out should there be any other uh, questions. You all know where to find me here at uh, CTS in terms of um, my email address and all of that. So yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Davis. I really I'm I'm deeply grateful for your you're sharing your wisdom and your perspective. And I love the way that you brought in uh, Resma and uh, blended it with your own theological perspectives and um, therapeutic engagement, the, the way that you uh, are practicing th therapy, uh, the way that you're engaging theology in the midst of therapy without even necessarily naming it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really a beautiful way of talking about it. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank oh, yeah. You. That clap thing. <laughs> so much more tech savvy than I am. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a good rest of your afternoon. All right. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, folks? Um, Dr. Russell, I do have a question regarding um, the assignments. So uh -huh. for those of us that did the, the paper assignment, Yes. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we have time to fulfill that, to fulfill the, the, the assignment requirement as far as discussing it in class. Yeah, let me, um, let me hang on just a second. Technology, uh, where is it? There we go. Um, oops, now it disappeared. All right. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at so so the idea is that we're going to meet in our small groups and we're going to talk about the the practices um, and share your responses. So some of that would be sharing if you did write if you did do one of the the short paper and engaging the practices uh, and share it what you either remember what you wrote and share that like that or if you have to read it, I suppose you could read it, but uh, in our small groups, that's what I'm hoping to do um, after we come back from break. Did you um, mean it in a different way? Did I misunderstand what your question was? 
No, you answered perfect. Thank okay. you. All right, perfect. Yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that opportunity because I think so much of this work is has to really begin in our in our own hearts and in our own bodies and in our own willingness to open our minds and hearts to what's going on in the bodies and to hear what's going on in other people's bodies and hearts and minds and experiences. And so uh, that as um, Minikin says, we need to go slow, right? We can't just we can't just go through it really quickly. I mean, it, it's a it's a slow process and it takes some time. Um, and to be able to sit with each other and to do that, I, I think will be a helpful use of our time. Cassidy, you you raised your hand. Yeah, I usually just jump in, so it was fun oh. to raise my hand and be respectful. Um, so, oh, my question is: so I did the short paper for Resma, which included some of my reflections on the practices. Yeah. Do you want, in addition to that, a separate response with the, the re reflections on the practices? Or is just the short paper, since it includes that, fine? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, okay. The idea is that even if you didn't write that short paper, Hopefully you did some of the practices and maybe you can remember what you did. Maybe some of that involved writing some things down with pen and paper or chalk and chalkboard or whatever it is you have. Um, and then we can share, you can share that in the small group discussion. Uh, and then, because I asked you to, to keep a journal and the journals for next week as well. Uh, does that help? Sorry if I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not, that, that wasn't that clear. It was clear in my mind when I wrote it. Yeah, I guess I didn't keep a journal. I didn't realize, like a daily journal or just? Just your own reflections on the book when you're, as you're reading it and the, the exercises that you're doing. I asked you to do particular ones. I mean, you can do other ones, but I asked you specifically to do particular ones. Oh, okay. I guess I just didn't see that. So it's in the syllabus and I moved over it. <laughs> Oh, was it in the syllabus too? I saw it on the discussion board. Yeah, it's on the discussion board. Oh, okay. It's please keep, it says please here, let me show you. Please keep a journal while a computer file can be used. I suggest that you write in longhand paper with your responses and respond to three to five of the body, pra the body practices. And I listed the ones that I suggested that you do and then include it in your journal and be ready to share. And then if you wanted to be more um, formal about it, you could write a paper about that, but you did, you're required to write a paper, but you were um, asked to do this. Um, and then for next time, and let me see if this works because sometimes it won't let you do this. Does everybody see uh, April 14th? Does anybody see April 14th? Yeah, okay. So then we'll continue um, reading some more of, of Menekin's book. And then there's, there's a, a intergenerational trauma and discussions um, from the woman that uh, Christina Davis was talking about. And then I asked you to continue with your journal. Um, and let's see if I can get that to come up. Uh, and then the, the journal then is due next week to share what you're comfortable with sharing. And you can do that, like we'll do that in small groups um, or or there might be, there's a time to do that in the large group if anybody, you know, maybe from the small group, you wanna share a little bit about what got talked about. I mean, I'm aware that some of this may be hard to share. And um, that's why I'm asking you to do it in the small group first. And then you get to choose what you wanna share from the journal. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So you're not actually asking for a, um... Word document of our whole journal. No, no, I, I'm I'm asking you. So I say, share a summary of what you're comfortable sharing with me or others. Okay. Right? Yeah. If that's on a computer or if that's hey, I took some pictures. Yeah. So my guess is that somebody like Cassidy might might uh, include a painting or poem or something like that. I'm just picking on you, Cassidy, because I I know in the past you have included uh, other forms of engaging the issues. So that's perfectly fine as well. I'm happy to be picked on. Okay, good. So that's for next week.
Any other questions? Um, we're going to go ahead and take a break. So maybe 15, 20 minutes and let's come back at um, quarter to four. Let's be back by quarter to four. And actually, before you go, let me put you in your small group because I'd like you to be in your small groups. Um, so to come back, be in your small groups for about a half hour or so and share those. And I you might need, you might want more time than that. If you do, just let me know um, to share some of the stuff that, you know, if you don't want to share your answers, you can share what the experience was like in writing it or in reading it or some questions that you might have. Um, any questions about that? Okay, so we have three breakout groups and um, So Brittany, um, are you okay being with the boys or would you rather be with the, um, with the MTS girls? The boys only have two folks. Um, Is there a reason I'm not gonna be with Bree and Jill? Did I miss something? <laughs> No, no, no. Well, I can put, Ro I was going to put Rosalind in with Jill and, and Bree. Oh, okay. You know. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, that's fine. I can put, I can put Rosalind in with the boys. Who, yeah. is anybody? Yeah. <laughs> no. Roz, you want to be with Bree and Jill. They're great. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Um, I think it might be helpful to have, um, since there are two persons of color to have them in the same group. I've just yeah, trying to follow a sensitive mm -hmm. training but is that okay or would you rather yeah, be that's, a, that's fine that's fine okay can you transport us all to florida too while you're at it i would yeah. too i would actually prefer to go to california but you know For uh, sure. yeah okay got okay folks so i'll see you back here at four let's see you'll be back there four twenty okay does that work? Or if you need more time, maybe 4.30, you just let me know, okay? Okay, so go ahead and get in your groups and then um, take a break. I'm here if anybody has a question.
Actually, it's a picture um, from the park that's just up the down the actually actually down the street from where the the boyfriend lives. But yeah, it's raining here. It rained here, so I had to come in. Have you? Has anybody seen that park? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a lovely story as well. So, how were the conversations? They were productive. We had some really good conversations in our group. Wonderful. Can you share some with share that we don't share anything that you think shouldn't be shared? But um, well, I'll let Jill and Rosalyn speak for themselves. But I um, I share some of my reflections and experiences um, of of the book as well as my paper and the fact that I did it during Holy Week. Like I think that really had a, a huge influence on the way that I engage the book as well as the writing. Mm. I don't mind sharing the poem that I, I wrote. Um, oh, wonderful. Do that. Okay. One second, I'm, a, I'm going to pull it up. So the poem is titled, um, Love and War. At the hand of police, a black boy dies. Alongside his mother, the black community cries. They hate us. Fear us, kill us. Only in pop culture do they want to be us. Let us not generalize all the whites. Some have a conscience and for us, they fight. Others try really hard to care, but fall short. The system is stacked against us, including the courts. Who would deliver us from this bondage of death? He cried, I can't breathe, as he took his last breath. No politician, no pastor, no person, nope. In these figures, we must not put our hope. Only in Father God, Jesus Christ. On a hill called Calvary, he paid the ultimate price. Ephesians 6 and 12 tells the truth behind the hate. With an ugly American history, it far precedes the date. We need love for each other, no matter creed or color, and war against the enemy, and not each other. Wow. That's really powerful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. You're very talented, too. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Russell. Anyone else in, in uh, Bree's group that would like to share? Uh, anyone in a different group? Well, I'm not sure I can gather my wits after that powerful poem, Brianna. That was very, very moving. Yeah. But I will say that uh, in my group, uh, one of the things that I appreciated in our conversation was them helping me take some of my scrambled eggs understandings and misunderstandings about trauma and whether it can or can't be treated and can't or can't be healed and can or can't be metabolized or integrated or whatever those words are trying to communicate. And I felt like uh, our conversation helped me sort through some of those things that I'm not necessarily naturally inclined to make sense of. And uh, so that was a really productive experience for me. Well, thank you for sharing that, Dave. Thank you. I think everyone is at different places in this, in this work. And I think the important thing is to keep moving forward and um, to be as integrous and honest with ourselves and each other as we can be. Anyone else from, what are you guys? You are the doves, no, lambs? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, 
how about the amphibians? Yeah, um, we had a good conversation about um, like physical feelings and emotional feelings as it relates to the body practices that we engage with. And then we had a good conversation about experiences where we've been able to um, engage in those practices like in like real life situations. Um, so it was a good, it was a good conversation. Good, good. And well, we found out about the light, the pink light behind Emily. Oh, so. yes, it's got something to do with letting the, um, the marijuana grow stronger. <laughs> Oh, that made me so happy. <laughs> You're not going to share? <laughs> like, oh, oh, wait, me? About the yeah. grow lights? Yeah. Oh, um, apparently they're like, they're red and blue, so they make pink. And apparently pink light is the greatest choice for growing your plants better. I don't know. Like they don't really care about the ambient light color, but they want it to be pink. And I feel like it's helped. So I don't know. I haven't killed as many plants. Interesting. So 20 years ago, one might say, so all plants are gay. <laughs> but anyway, so um Anyone else in that group have anything to share besides the pink lights? I think Emily and I both know, uh, kind of connected on like the imagining the time when you've been resilient or like something's worked mm -hmm. out better than you would have ever imagined was like really impactful for both of us. Um, I just like, we were describing all of the feelings in some of the other situations and how there's like feelings of constriction in your body and for me, like the only way I could describe that was like just that feeling of like, and like release and realizing mm -hmm. sometimes I get when you're caught up into those feelings of constriction, you forget the possibilities that are present. So connecting to moments of resiliency reminded Ooh, yeah. that we can like be present to our bodies and move into healthier spaces. Yeah, I think, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I think that the being present with our bodies is really key. And I think uh, uh, Menicum's point is that it's really key that when we are able to actually be present with our bodies and name, um, name or recognize the sensations and go slow and let the sensations be there and let us and let yourself feel the feelings without necessarily judging them or giving them a name. I mean, giving them a good or bad, um, that it can help, uh, particularly when the feelings are, are in the body and not just emotions, but you know, both, um, it can really be a way of letting that energy move and letting the biases that we may have developed. Um, each of us probably has different biases, but some of us have very similar biases um, because American culture has, has imprinted them, I think, on our bodies. Um, to let ourselves become aware of those. And as we become aware of those, then we can make a more uh, conscious and intentional decision about what they mean and what we want to do with them. Seems like that's what he's saying. Yeah. But I could be misreading it. You know, Dr. Russell, in our conversation, I first of all, I can't I can't tell you how how great it is to be with this class today, but mm -hmm. I was really enlightened and my imagination stretched that this 
trauma, this racial tension is far beyond black and white. Um, and certainly the white experience um, with the, nat the native uh, encounter also mm -hmm. um, enters into this conversation. Um, so I, I was glad to, for that to be raised in my consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, that there are white Americans that are, uh, have been traumatized uh, with love in their, uh, in their system. The second thing that I thought was very important that we discuss uh, was this idea that the author brings out that this is not a cognitive experience. That mm -hmm. It's not in the intellectualized and therefore the concepts can't, they aren't easily understood. You can, you can sympathize, but that the next step into empathizing that experience is difficult because it's such an embodied experience. If we could just think our way through it and intellectualize our way through it, um, then this conversation would be a little easier uh, to move forward. But because it is an embodied experience, it's in our body, I think that becomes some of the challenges that we have to overcome and, and really learning to sit in each other's spaces. Um, so I, I just thought I'd share that. Thank you, Rosalind. I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody uh, in the class here being willing to, to be vulnerable and share with each other and engage the important and I think hard uh, lessons and hard, um, perhaps difficult to recognize and realize and know what to do with uh, insights that uh, Minicum is, has given us. Uh, has shared with us, has revealed to us. Uh, I think it's a really powerful book um, and he's doing some powerful work. Um, I hope you also got a chance to listen to the, the videos, both of him and of, um, the, let's see. No, that's not it. Um, so next week we'll also be focusing on the same books or the same book and the same topic. Uh, and we'll be doing a little bit um, with uh, uh, sharing some more with our journals and um, also looking at uh, the effects of slavery today. Uh, the, the, uh, Joy de, de Goin, de Groin, de, I'm not sure how to say her name, um, her discussion about how um, the trauma of slavery has continued to um, impact either from discussion from family memories or, or just imaginings um, of what your family or your ancestors suffered uh, as well as perhaps some body um, memory, some gene memory. Um, and so I, I hope we'll continue to be able to be candid with each other and to hold each other's um, woundedness and woundingness um, gently. Are there, any other questions or comments? All right, well, um, I'm gonna go ahead and let us out a little early then. And I encourage you to send me, uh, well, those of you who wrote your, your papers, I assume you've already sent them to me, but you might take a look at just thinking about the class making sure that you've got two of those papers. Um, so the next one, I think there's one more left. So to make sure that you've got that one done. I know the MTS students, you already, if you've turned in your MTS proposal, that counts as one. You're um, developed the MTS proposal. Good, okay. All right, well, thank you so much for your attention and um, 
I will uh, send Dr. Davis a, a thank you note and I'll won't sign your name. I'll just say our class. So, all right, well, thank you again. Um, and Cassidy, can I just talk to you before? Can you stay on for a minute? Sure thing. Okay, thanks. Dr. Russell, I wanted to ask you before thank I depart, was thank the- Thanks, Roz. Was the, uh, the Rambo session that I missed on the 24th recorded? Uh, it was, but I think they, they only keep those recordings for a little bit. Oh. Uh, uh, I'll, we can see if, um, uh, Lauren, I mean, Laura Beth saved it somehow. Uh, I'll see if I can figure out if, if it's still saved. I have a feeling it probably isn't, but unless it got saved to somebody's computer. Right, right. Yeah, but uh, if it is, I'll certainly send it along. I'm glad your COVID uh, shot has worn off or the problem <laughs> has. part has worn off. Yeah, it, it's done now. Thank you for asking. But you have to take another one, right? No, I'm done now. That was my second. Oh, okay, good. The first one was eventless. The second one was a baseball bat to my head. Oh, wow. Which one did you have? Uh, Pfizer. Oh, yeah, that's what I had. It, it didn't baseball baseball me, but I did, did knock me out for a day or so. Well, I will let you have your conversation with Cassidy. So yep. have a good evening, you guys. Thank you. You too, David. All right. right. Yes. There were some things that came up in our group that like, it was, you know, it's complicated. It, it wasn't sure if we should, I should bring it up. And I didn't also, I also didn't want the people in my group to feel outed. So it was like, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But like um, me and Sarah Lynn are in a Monday night class in Dr. Russaw's African-American biblical hermeneutics and womanist biblical interpretation class. Yeah. I have to close my eyes to say all that. <laughs> and uh, we're minority white people. So we get a chance to kind of engage in these practices weekly. Like yeah. Sarah, Sarah Lynn and I kind of bonded over, over like what a gift that is. And also just like, it's really tiring because we meet the full three hours and it's like engaging in, you know, like, what's going on with our bodies while also being in class and learning and so. So she has you doing similar kind of body bodily response stuff? No, no, she's, she's not having us do anything like that. It's yeah. just being a white body in a predominantly black space. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. And so like naturally what comes up for us as white people when, you know, like I don't wanna be the white person that talks too much in a black space. I don't wanna be the white person that dominates the conversation and and yet also recognizing like we're students and you know all that but you both kind of talk a lot in any class <laughs> yeah well you do i mean yeah. professors typically like that unless you're saying something really stupid and neither yeah. one of you has ever said anything stupid that i've heard mm -hmm. so well, Sarah Lynn's auditing that. And so she talked about how she's like, I'm so glad I'm auditing because otherwise I'd feel like I need to speak up more. Yeah. But. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting uh, reflection. Feel free to bring it into your journal if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, I might. Because it's a, it's a great experience. Like I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I'm wondering if it actually, in those instances, right? Because we're also studying those topics. I wonder if it kind of deepens my learning hmm. because it's like my body is engaged in a different way. I don't know. Just. Yeah. Well, and, but you're online, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that would make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like comparing that to like the mixed methods preaching conference I was at. Yeah. Where I was minority white person, like, very different feelings, similar, but different. Yeah. Yeah, I, that might be. I, um, 
was reflecting upon it. And I also have, to me, the gender is really important in it. Mm. To me, uh, a black man walking down the street. Well, right now, I'm just, I wear a mask. So yeah. somebody's not wearing a mask and I'm yeah. downtown. So there's a lot of African-Americans walking around without masks. I just go to the other side of the street. Sure. It doesn't have to be, you know, if it's black or white or man or female, but, right. but there's a strange black man. I mean, a, man, a, man, a black man that I don't know yeah. walking down the street by himself or a group on the Monon. Mm-hmm. I'm my body gets nervous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, yeah. not very different experience than a group of mixed people, mixed gender. Yeah, um, whether they're black or white, or a group of women. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that has something to do with, uh, you know, having gender violence, been a victim of gender violence. But also, I think that I mean, I remember noting this when I was in graduate school mm -hmm. and I was in a group of mixed gender wise. I think we were all, well, there's a Korean guy there, a Korean American guy, but um, otherwise we were, there weren't any African-Americans with us, but, and saying something like in West Hollywood, I'm like, oh, it's so nice to come to West Hollywood where I don't have that tension in the back of my neck and back yeah. all the time walking around in the neighborhood and I remember the guy saying well, what do you mean like because they're gay like I don't feel this sense of violence could be done to me at any moment yeah and they had no sense in which I mean and the other women in the group were like yeah I hadn't thought of it but you're right I don't have to feel that because they're gay right and there was this completely interesting conversation with the guys having no idea that women adult women felt that way like they had mm. no idea they couldn't wow. like and so it, i mean it, it is it's not the same thing but i i reflect upon how my body responded then and how my body's responding now um, yeah. but anyway so probably just to be more. clear i just realized this will this be cut out of the oh, recording yeah 